Good morning. I'd like to use as a sermonic theme this morning, follow the leader. Follow the leader. Simon says, turn to your neighbor. <laughs> Simon says, go. Simon says, stop. Run. Simon says, put your finger on your nose. Simon says, hop on one foot. Simon says, jump with two feet. Simon says, raise your hands in the air and say hallelujah. hallelujah. Say hallelujah. hallelujah. <laughs> the childhood game, Simon says, appoints one person known as Simon to be the leader. Simon gives the command to all the other players, but there's one catch. The command must start with the phrase, Simon says. The other players must follow the command only if it begins with Simon. This game is all about what Simon says, and if Simon didn't say it, then you are not to do it. As the game progresses, you must listen, because if you do something that Simon didn't say, you are out of the game. The game continues with more commands from Simon, and sometimes Simon doesn't say anything. The last player remaining, or the one who successfully follows all of Simon's commands, wins the game. Listening and then adhering to what you hear makes you a winner. This is where we enter the biblical text today. God is issuing a bunch of commands for Moses to listen and follow. They are specific and exact. We are on the 10th in this text today in Final Plague. What's today's day? Y'all seem unsure. The 10th, September the 10th. So on the 10th day of the first month, he issued the directives. Simon says, God says, for the Final Plague. The first plague was turning the Nile into blood. The second plague was frogs swarming the land. The third was the dust of the land turned into swarms of gnats, lices. The fourth was flies. The fifth was a disease struck the livestock leading to the death of cattle and horses and donkeys. The sixth was boils on humans. The seventh was hail mixed with fire destroying the crops and homes. The eighth was locusts devoured the crops that were left over. The ninth, darkness covered the land for three days with no visibility. And now we are at the threat of the 10th plague, the final plague, the death of the firstborn, humans, animals. How many of you are the firstborn or your parents? Raise them hands higher, come on now. <laughs> you get it death. All of these plagues were initiatives by God to get Pharaoh to take his hands off the wheel of the Israelites' future. God says, let my people go. The plagues continue to be an extension of Moses' request to Pharaoh to let my people go. So on the 10th of the month, each household was to select an unblemished goat. The goat could have no physical deformities. Think about that. No disease, no injuries, no abnormalities, healthy eyes, healthy teeth, proper weight, size, certain age requirements. This animal was considered an offering to God, and the animal had to be in excellent condition. On the evening of the 14th at twilight, which is just after sunset, the lambs were to be killed. And then the blood of the lamb was to be applied to the doorposts of each of their homes. And then the lambs were to be roasted. And then they were to eat the lambs along with leavened bread and bitter herbs. Sort of an all-you-can-eat buffet where you can only consume what you can eat, but you can't take, a, you can't take any bags home. 
Anything that was not eaten in the Old Testament was burned. This is what has become known as the Passover. God would see the blood on the doorposts and pass over these houses with the final and tenth plague of the firstborn. So maybe we need to pause for a moment. Breathe. Imagine you had two kids and you hear one crying. You go to see what has happened. The kid crying tells one story. See, Keith pushed me, and I hit my head, and yada, yada, yada. Now here's Keith trying to get in so he can tell his story as well. And when he gets done, it's different from Shelby's story. Two sides of the same story. Today we have the Israelite side of the story. I imagine if we heard the other side, we might, we might get another story. But we don't hear that side of the story. The Hamilton play says, who lives, who dies, who tells your story? All of that matters, and as we read the text, we should always be asking, who's telling this story? If the pill ever feels just a little too big to swallow, you may want to ask, who's telling the story? So this is how it went down for the Israelites, because the Israelites are telling the story. This is their story about obedience and about the protection of God. This is a story about God showed up for God's people. This is their story. This is a story about having the courage to follow the leader. God says, go tell Pharaoh to let my people go. Now, I'm sure there were a couple conversations that didn't get recorded between God and Moses. And I'm sure it took a lot of courage for Moses to speak to the powers of the land. The negotiations went back and forth with Moses getting sent back again and again. But by the 10th plague, God was done with Pharaoh. Talking had ceased. Action was like the Vitamix turned on high. And God was like, remember this day. Remember this day. When the storms come, remember this day. When the water runs out, remember this day. When the heat ain't working, remember this day. When the walk seems all uphill, remember this day. When you don't know what is next, remember this day. When you can't imagine the next chapter of your life, remember this day. When your bills are growing, remember this day. When your health is a challenge, remember this day. When you get discouraged, remember this day. When you want to cry, Remember this day. Remember, this is a story of liberation that required God's people to follow the leader. In counseling, there's an exercise called verbatim. As implied, for this part of the session, the counselor tries to recall word for word everything that was stated in that part of the section of the counseling. The exercise helps them to observe the session more closely. When done in a group, the group is able to observe and provide insight into what may have happened during the counseling session. Verbatim is an opportunity to suspend judgment and ag agendas and give oneself 100% to the art of listening. The person listens the first time in session. And then the person listens a second time as they write down verbatim what was stated. And then the person gets to listen a third time as they reflect with their peers in a group. This week at the Equalizer movie, another moviegoer turned around and said to me, this is my second time. The second time, he announced, I always hear and see something I miss the first time. I imagine as Moses was communing with God and God with him, a verbatim was happening. This is what you say when you go meet with Pharaoh, verbatim. This is what you're going to say to the people, verbatim. This is how it's going to go down, verbatim. This is how you will sacrifice the lamb, verbatim. Don't boil it, don't eat it raw, verbatim. Don't take any of the organs out, too much information, verbatim. 
The time of the Passover, verbatim, just after sunset, verbatim. What to do afterwards, verbatim. Put blood on your doorpost, verbatim. We are now at the 10th plague, verbatim. And I can hear or imagine music playing in the background. Let my people go. Let my people go. God says, I will pass over you as this calamity comes upon the land. No plague, not the first, not the second, and not this tenth, will touch you. This story sets the stage for following God, for following our leader. Today I started with Simon Says as a metaphor for following God. I would like to end with another Simon Says story, another Simon Says game. Once upon a time in a small close-knit neighborhood, there lived a young boy named Simon. Simon was known for his boundless energy and enthusiasm. He loved playing games with his friends, and his favorite was Simon Says. Y'all are so smart. Every sunny afternoon, the children gathered at the local park to enjoy their favorite pastime. Simon was enthusiastic, and he was incredibly creative. He added a new, unique twist to the game. Instead of simply instructing his friends with comments like, Simon says, jump. Simon says, clap your hands. Simon says, wave your hands in the air and shout hallelujah. He turned it into a game of positivity and encouragement. One day as the sun bathed the park in its golden glow, Simon gathered his friends. He announced today we're going to play Simon Says differently. We're going to use it to uplift each other. His friends were intrigued. Simon started with Simon Says, tell the person next to you something you appreciate about them. The game began and compliments flowed freely. Kids were smiling, feeling valued, and cherish. The next round went like this. Simon says, share a dream you have and let your friends encourage you to pursue it. This round brought out aspiration and friends inspired each other with their support and belief. As the game continues, Simon's positive variations grew even more remarkable. Simon says, forgive someone for something that bothered you. Forgiveness, they discovered, was liberating, and the bonds between friends grew stronger. They played until the sun set, leaving behind a park filled not just with laughter, but with warmth of deeper connections and a newfound inspiration. Simon had transformed a simple game into a beautiful way to spread encouragement, to spread love among his friends. From that day on, Simon Says game in the neighborhood was never the same. It became a symbol of kindness and support and inspiration. All thanks to a young boy named Simon. <laughs> with a heart full of enthusiasm and a desire to make the world a better place, one game at a time. Kindness, support, inspiration. I think it's something we all could use. God says that and so much more in this Bible text. God in our Bible speaks about love. God speaks about grace. God speaks about mercy. God speaks about justice rolling down verbatim. And I and you, we can follow our leader. Amen.